production presents the best of the best movies. No time to joke. Irresistible actions. In one of the poorest slums in Uganda, one of the most impoverished nations on earth, a revolution in action filmmaking is taking place. The product of the relentless creative passion and drive of both a man native to the ghettos of Wakalaga named Isaac Godfrey Jeffrey Nabwana and the multi-talented members of his super low-budget film studio, Ramon Film Productions. Isaac's first foray into bringing his unique take on the action film genre to an eager Western audience was with his hugely successful, widely shared viral hit, Who Killed Captain Alex? the success of which can at least be partially attributed to the efforts of an equally ambitious and intrepid American, whom not only now acts as co-producer for Raman Film Productions, but also now stars in Isaac's films, and is now the keen and ever-loyal resident Mzungu of what is known as Wakaliwood. In an effort to learn more about life as a Ugandan action movie star, and to gain an insight into the creative processes and challenges of becoming the latest unlikely worldwide phenomenon in filmmaking, Bad Movie Bad Reviews sat down with Alan Hoffmanis a man who has dedicated his entire life to making the Wakaliwood dream become a reality. While those back home may still know him as Alan, a once film producer and film festival director from New York, any of us who have been made aware of this emergent stream of creative insanity coming out of the slums of Kampala will of course know him as one Mr. Commando Jesus. Alan, thanks for joining us and welcome. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what my full name is, though. Yeah, I've, I've heard there's been a few uh, extensions to your name. No, oh, exactly. It's quite normal, you know, there. But it's, uh, what, Alan Sali, Oe and Chima, Musaja Wakabaka, Nemef, and Yesu Muganda, Laptop, Afmanis. A laptop, you know, is because I've always got a laptop, so the kids are just, you know. <laughs> So you're you're a native New Yorker, right? But you're you're actually living in Uganda, helping to not only create Wakaliwood films themselves, but also to bring them to the attention of the wider world. How did you get involved in all of this? I saw 90 seconds of Who Killed Captain Alex, Uganda's first action movie, yes. on YouTube. And yes. two weeks later, I came to Uganda, okay. to track down who made the film. Did you know that? She did not know that. Well, the short story is is. Uh... You know, my girl dumped me the day about the wedding ring, and two weeks later, I became a Ugandan action movie star. <laughs> as you do. Yeah, as you do. And so I was in a bar in St. Mark's Place in Manhattan, and I was kind of depressed, so to cheer me up, a friend of mine showed me the trailer for Who Killed Captain Alex, uh, just on his iPhone in this bar. He's laughing because it's really funny, you know, it's, it's, people love this. Uh, but I wasn't laughing. Like, I, 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 I thought it was, I thought it was genius. And my background uh, is in production for many years. I mean, I was a cinematographer for a bit, but then sound mixer, art director and all that, everything in production. And then after that, I was uh, working with film festivals and um, curating and programming. And I was a festival program director up in, uh, in New York, and so you know, you, you present to audiences. You know how to market things. You know how to put together and celebrate stuff. And so, I'm looking at this trailer, and and it just blew my mind. It's obvious they have no money, but in the West, if you have no money, uh, you know, you do a love story, right? You do a family reunion. You don't make a war film, and you don't try to do it serious, and you don't have 200 people with helicopters and explosions and all this. Like there was this integrity to it. It wasn't ironic. That's something I was actually personally struck by when I first saw Who Killed Captain Alex was how how genuine this was. Yeah. Like this is a guy who he he wanted to make a fucking war movie, yeah. damn it, and he's gonna make one yeah. regardless of you know what his budget is or what his limitations yeah. are. And so that's that's what threw me is that on the one hand it's obvious, obviously funny and it's a comedy and it's silly in some ways, but on the other hand it's really he's really trying. I, I just couldn't get it out of my head and. There was no information online. There was nothing. I mean, they, but lots of people were talking about it, but no one knew what it was because the films weren't available. 
And so, you know, people would think maybe this is, uh, maybe these are trailers for films that were never made. And I'm looking and I'm like, no, I think this is legit. Like, I think these, there's real movies here and he's pulling clips from a finished film. You know, I went online and, and, and I bought a ticket to Africa, yo. And I got the cheapest ticket I could the soonest. I would have gone that night, but you know, it's $12,000. So, uh, you know, I waited like 10 days later where I can get a ticket that I had the money for. That was it. And so I, and, uh, and I just tracked him down and, you know, I knew I would find him uh, in Uganda, though I had never been. I knew nothing. I knew absolutely nothing. Uganda could be Mars to me. Like, what do you know of Uganda? You know, Idi Amin, you be child soldiers. You just, it's, it's the history of suffering really, or poverty or AIDS, you know? You know, it has this visceral history of, of, of sadness. And yet you have this crazy action comedy thing coming up from the same place. So um, I did have his phone number because that's his phone number on all the trailers. Because it's like pizza there. You know, like if you want this movie, you call him up, he delivers it. And so, uh, so I had it, but I didn't call because I'm coming. Like I'm coming anyway. And, uh, and I, was, I guess I was a little afraid if I did call, for some reason he may say no. So I, I just said, no, I'm showing up. And I knew I would find him because uh, films are big, man. They're ex explosive, literally. But I, but I knew people would know who this guy is. I mean, they have to. And uh, I found a guy selling his movies and he brought me to his place on the back of a motorcycle to the slum. And so when I say slum and, and ghetto, these are their words. Because I asked them, like, like, what is this? And so it's, a, it's, it's the ghetto. So it's, it's a slum area. It's the city of Kampala. And the ghetto is the name would be the name of each indip individual village in the slum. So ours is Wakaliga, ergo Wakali Wood. Wakaliga is the place, Wakali Wood is the dream. Brings me to Wakaliga, and Isaac was sitting there. He's sitting on his, on his front, right by the front door with a cup of tea. And I pull up and I say, hello, my name is Alan. Uh, I'm from New York and uh, I'm a fan and I, I just like to talk. And he looked at me and said, okay. And we, um, we spoke for about six hours, because it was already getting late. But then we spoke about everything. And I'm asking, I guess, all the right questions, like what is your software? How do you market the films? What computers do you use? Uh, where do the props come from? Who does the costumes? You know, you know, how are the scripts written? I'm asking the creative questions, and he got very excited because no one's ever asked him these things. I, I, no one told me I would do that. I just saw movies, and then I said, I think at least they do it, they do it this way. That's how I started teaching the actors how to do things. And uh, uh, then we came out with some production. I started by making a dolly. The director gave me a photo and asked me to fabricate one. We even got police approval to make and use toy guns. We make these things from scrap, but we also need the real ones. And um, so we just, in like six hours, we first met. It soon became evident that Isaac was a far more accomplished and experienced filmmaker than Alan first presumed. What also became apparent was the shared love of the medium and genre that both Isaac and Alan possessed, and that Alan's journey to Uganda, based on little more than a hunch after witnessing the trailer for Who Killed Captain Alex, would soon have a profound impact on both their lives. That's when I learned that uh, Who Killed Captain Alex, we think, is his 32nd feature film. And we, and we say think because he keeps forgetting and remembering other ones. But most of those films in that period are lost, they're gone. We are still finding some of them, they come up. But what it is is because, you know, at this period, the computers he built, you know, out, out of all these scrap parts, he kind of taught himself how to do it. And this one like manual, <laughs> how to build the computer. And he had like an 80 gig hard drive. And so what he, the system was, he would make a film, put it on the DVD and then archive it. And then you wipe out the computer and you make the next film. So everything, all, all the elements are gone. And um, but what happened, of course, is that DV these DVDs themselves are really crappy. They're these Chinese knockoffs, so they don't last at all. They were very disposable, and it's okay if they're disposable to him because it's not like us here. Like here, if you make a short film, you have a dream of going to Cannes, right? You want to get the film to Sundance, maybe you'll get an agent and go on. Uh, there's none thinking there because it's completely impossible. So your, your ambition is your own village. Is your as your neighbors? It's like that. So you make the film and they move on, and he has to he has to he has to jump on the next one, you know. So we think it's his thirty second film. Uh, that said, we have Jesus. It keeps changing, but about fifteen finished action horror films. Mm -hmm. 
So my mission uh, is to get the films out and also to preserve, <laughs> you know, an archive. And basically what I, I, I think I'm uh, doing two things. One, I think I'm putting kerosene on their bonfire. So on the one hand, it is, it is I understand, but the other is, is this is madness in a good way, you know? And then once you see how they make it, because no one does this. No one, no one builds equipment like this that I know of. You know, maybe a little bit they try, but not on, on 16 foot jibs. And they work, they work beautifully. And the other one is that uh, I really do think, I would say crazy as it sounds, but it's not crazy anymore. I think it's happening is that I really think Isaac and the guys are contributing like a verse to the play of life. You know, they're saying something, you know, they're, 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 they're a part of this, of this play of life. And, and I get the stage manage, you know, I get to make sure the lights are on and the microphone's plugged in. It's kind of like that. So on one end, like we're all acting in the films and, you know, just making them uh, together. But then for mine is like, my thing was like, well, how do I, how do I get this out? Because to me, it's, it's easy. To me, it's obvious. It's like, these are, these are just fun action comedies and they play. Despite Alan's initial enthusiasm and eagerness to explore the further introduction of Work Hollywood to Western audiences, Alan was soon to find that politics and racial preconceptions were to place seemingly insurmountable obstacles in his and Isaac's path. In the beginning, I thought it was going to be easy. So this is back in 2011, 2012, and I thought uh, it was going to be very easy, and it was quite the opposite. We were all essentially blacklisted because um, anyone I knew was saying like, well, like I'm promoting violence in Africa. What, like, what am I doing personally with this thing? I'm just promoting these stereotypical images of, of Africans killing each other. But I'm like, their comedies are fun. It's their movies, you know, this is what they're doing. And they have millions of views for the trailer. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is just fun stuff. And that would, that would make Isaac in Uganda so angry because he's like, why can't I make an action film? You know, where is there, what, where is this list of countries that are not allowed to make action films? Because America can do it, you know, Malaysia does it, everyone does it. Why can't Uganda do it? And who made that list? I want to meet the person who made that list. But there was this, there was a fear of that. And then the other thing that happened was, it's around 2012, it was called the Christmas gift from the president to, to Uganda, was that outlawed the practice of homosexuality. President Yoweri Museveni was ushered into the conference center of the State House in Tebe and immediately without wasting any time, signed the controversial anti-homosexuality bill into law. And so suddenly we're caught up in all this. And our motto is literally like, we kill everyone equally, man. That's the motto. You know, anyone can come visit, you know, they can die, head blown off, they'd be put in the movie and all this. But then suddenly we're, we're, we're caught up in this. And so it was a double hit. It was one is like, I guess the optics, as they say, of Africans, you know, guns shooting each other, even if it's a cartoon. And then the other part is like, well, if we do play a film from them, aren't we supporting, by proxy, supporting the, the established government and their practices? What people care about is the story and how passionately and how talented it was told. And that's it. It has nothing to do with demographics. It's nothing to do with being in a slum or being in the upper classes. It has to do with story. I thought we were screwed, but at the same time, I really thought it was genius. I really thought I really, and it wasn't like I hoping anything. I really thought it, I thought this is legit, but it's going to take 20 years because, you know, I can, I can talk to people, I can show this stuff, but I can't change parliament. I can't do anything about that. So I really thought we were not finished, but I thought it's going to be 20 years. And, but I did still think it would work at that point. People were giving me the advice people were giving me was, well, get out of it. I mean, shelve it. You know, it's a good thing. Maybe if you think it's good, OK, but now is not the right time. And it was true. It was not the right time. But I thought it was the right time to work on it. Upon Alan's return to Uganda and knowing that any progress that would occur would be the result of their own dedication and theirs alone, Isaac, Alan and the rest of the Wakaliwood crew began planning what would become the next and most vital step for the direction of the Wakaliwood dream came back uh, to Uganda and I said, okay, like we're, it's, it's just us. So, so what's the strategy? What do we do? And we came up with the idea of let's, let's clean up who killed Captain Alex. Like let's give it the subtitles. Let me fix some of the sound issues because there's a lot of charm to the, to their, their craft of filmmaking. 
but there's also like in the original cut, which will be public. I mean, we'll put these things out, but the original stuff is like the film can go to black for like two seconds for no reason, you know, stuff like that. My concern, thinking about the West, I don't want anything to pull you out of the movie, out of having fun. Expect the unexpectable. Mamma mia. Ah! Ow, 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 ow. Shit. I want you to be completely inside Isaac's head and enjoying the film. It's like a blackout for two seconds, it, it's going to stop the movie in your head. You're going to wonder if there is there a problem with the DVD? Is it like, you know, is there a problem with the projector? The, the sound, what was that? You know what I mean? It pulls you out of the movie experience. So my thing was that, like, let's get it so it's 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 clean while keeping all the charm. Mommy, I'm scared. Here we go. Mommy, mommy, mommy. So we started working out a strategy and the plan was it start with Captain Alex and uh, get it on its feet and we're probably gonna have to make it free. What if we put it on YouTube as a free thing? Uh, because because I knew, and they all knew, you know, Isaac and such, is that once people see it, they'll get it. And then it'll be okay. Then all these ideas about steroids, whatever, violence and all that kind of stuff will kind of dissolve. Uh, the worries people have, and you'll see what it for what it is. And so then, so, um, and plus we have, you know, older films and then he's making newer films. So we have, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's this catalog, so to speak. So it's okay, let's make the first one free. Let's get it started, you know? And then, so he's, so then it became, okay, so how do we do this? <laughs> and I thought it would take three months to get Alex ready. It took 18. And that's when I, I sold everything I had, cleared out the apartment and uh, I moved into the slum. Isaac, it reminds you of why you love movies in the first place. It just reminds it just reminds you why you do what you do, you know. And he's in, he's incredibly magnetic. I mean, I may be an extreme case, but uh, it took a while for me to realize a lot of the actors and kung fu guys they're not from there. Yeah, like there's a lot of people coming from different kind of parts of Uganda. Oh yeah, that that, that seems like it, it seems like a, a magnet for an awful lot of different kind of types of talent. Yeah. that kind of surprised me. I I, I thought it was a, a more centralized yeah. thing, but it's not. No, it's um and and so and these people, uh, yes, they are Ugandan, meaning it's it's what it is is tribal. So there's over 50 languages in Uganda, and those are different cultures, yo. And I, I've been to many weddings and many funerals, and they're always in these. Uh, the far, the deep village. And it's the funniest thing, these Ugandans have, they cannot talk to each other. They, so what, what you have are like, through piracy is ultimately it. Within Africa, uh, the films travel. And because they're very visual films, but in some ways also like Terminator and Rambo and such, those are silent movies. Like you don't need to know English to understand Predator, okay? <laughs> they're very visual. And Isaac's, Isaac's a very, vis very strong visual storyteller. So you can get it, you know? And so they, through piracy, they kind of travel throughout Africa and they come into the hands of some of these people and they can be like 17 years old. And they're like, that's what I want to do. And so, and they, and they find their way to Isaac the same way I did. You know, how do you do it? How do you do it? They travel and some of them have walked. They tell me they've walked like 200 kilometers kind of thing, just to, just to be a cannibal in a movie. The other part of it is that, you know, Uganda is very stratified. So there's, it's very much a strong border between upper class and lower class traditionally really more of an upper class thing it's expensive if it's even equipment is one thing but like say for us when we say expensive of course it's maybe not the budget exactly but it's very expensive for labor not even to mention action films which is the most expensive genre i think because you can't fake it like action films is defined by what you're seeing it's like for isaac he needs the costumes you need the sound effects you need the, the fire explosions you need like the uh the chroma of a, of a helicopter you need people who know kung fu it's it's very time consuming and labor intensive. Of course, there's many other filmmakers in Uganda, and they all do different things and things. But there's very few who are in the in the underclass like that, in the lower classes. And a lot of these guys coming from these villages, that's where they're more comfortable. These are the kinds of films they want to be part of. Because the upper class is more of a drama, right? A love story. Uh, Isaac calls them tripod movies because it's like the tripod's the star. The camera just sits there. <laughs> You say in Bad Black, like one of one of my favorite actors, Godzilla at the end. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it's like it's just amazing. Yeah. And so she was fun. Dude, there was how much charisma, right? She's so charismatic and funny. And and Isaac, I was not there for those shootings for for her scenes, but Isaac, so much of that was improv. So much snap in the neck and then spitting. It was, it was her.
the, the films are, are, are created b- backwards. And what I mean is the model in the West uh, is like you have, it's a stereotype, right? You have this, this writer late at night with a screenplay play, and then in a perfect world, you find other people to match this freaking fantasy you created. There, it's really the opposite. Uh, and part of it, I think, is this way I like to work too. Like it's, it's for me, you know, I've always liked to work with what you have, you know, and that's that's very much Isaac and Macaulay with him. Because he, what he is, he's an exploitation filmmaker, but he doesn't know it. Like he doesn't wouldn't know the term, say. But what I mean, like he exploits like the actors. If someone could sing, if someone could do this, okay, we'll put that in the movie. We'll do that. If you could do a backflip, okay, we'll put that in the movie. something I wanted to raise with you was your your role in Bad Black and I mean like incidentally like yeah I've, I've seen Black, Bad Black myself your role in it's absolutely <laughs> phenomenal it's such a such a great it's character so... and such a such a unique arc if you could call it that a new warrior on the block Alan is in action <laughs> America's best action star Tell us a bit about your experience in making that film in particular and the role itself. How, how did that all come about? Like, presumably it was written especially for you? Yeah, well, so what happened was Bad Black is actually based on a true story. Oh, it, was, it was a soap opera. It's like a, it's a living, living action soap opera in the newspapers. And at the time, this is when I visited in 2011 into 12, it's this woman and her name is Bad Black. And uh, she's kind of this gangster. And so she seduced like this CEO of some British company. And then uh, was was the girlfriend, all that, and then took all this tremendous amount of money from him. And I'm paraphrasing. And then he got all upset, went to the police, and then she became like the Robin Hood of Uganda, kind of giving all this money away to go to a bar and buy everyone drinks, all that kind of stuff, just spending it like crazy. And it was always, it was every day in the newspaper. And then I showed up. You know, we had the whole, we sat down, we met, and then that night, you know, I couldn't sleep. You know, he was staying up all night thinking, you know. Anyway, so I ended up calling him at like three in the morning and he was awake. I was awake and I said, look, I want to I want to work with you. Let's get some of these films out. Let's maybe co-produce stuff. But I think I also want to act. Uh, but I told him I never acted. He got very quiet and he said, let me think about it. And I thought that meant maybe yes, maybe no. What that meant was let me write a movie for you. And that was, that became Bad Black. Except you see, I'll, I'll show you how his brain works. So to give you an idea, it's like, OK, so um, so we're gonna do bad black, uh, except uh, you're not some executive in an oil company. Uh, you're a commando, and like instead of uh, going and complaining to the police like whatever, you pick up the machine gun and you blow up the slum. Alan is sunny in action. He has a machine gun. Super warrior. <laughs> because that, that goes through the the what Hollywood blender, you know. Run, you have run. to be a commando. You have to learn to fight for yourself. Forget your wife in America. She hates you. <laughs> That's my friend was Pupu. For real. This is Uganda. Pupu everywhere. You know, it was when I met him, I guess it was on a Sunday because it was very quiet and lazy and there's just children playing everywhere. I thought he had 30 children in the beginning. There's a kid's everywhere. He has three, but the, because you know, it's a movie set, you know, that's the fun place to play. So all the, all the kids in the village, that's where they hang out. But then he said, Let, let's meet everyone. And that's when I got it. And that was like the next day or so. And I saw that, okay, this is like 60 people, guys doing costumes and props and all this stuff. Everyone came out uh, to start shooting. And, and that's when I really saw the scale of what this maybe could be. You know, Isaac is introducing the idea of movies, while at the same time there's all these children growing up in a film lot, and the, the actors, and the actors, they're you know they're real life action heroes, the way I see it. You know, and certainly for the village, certainly for the children, and so they'd be doing a kung fu scene, and the camera's there. You look the other way, and all the children are doing the same kung fu moves. You know, they're studying what their hero is doing, ba 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 ba, and that's when I knew like this is something's gonna come from this because. While Isaac's introducing the idea, the kids are growing up knowing it, you know, they're, they're part of it. You touched on something there about, about sort of the inspiration for, for Isaac and for, for the kids there, for Ramon Film Productions itself, like how Western movie culture has formed an obvious inspiration for it. So, 
you know, you got your references to Rambo, Expendables, and whatnot. I, incidentally, um, have it here. I still have the envelope that was sent to me <laughs> saying, uh, uh, open carefully so you don't rip the poster of Stephen Senegal, which fucking, I lost my shit, man, whenever that came out, by the way. But yeah, so, it, it, but, but it's not just kind of Western cinema, there's a lot of Hong Kong cinema, and Kong Fu and martial arts and stuff. So uh, the way Isaac describes it is a triangle. It's definitely uh, like American action films, like from the 80s, uh, you know, the classics. The other, the other point is is uh, is kung fu, is is Chinese, is is, is Hong Kong cinema, uh, which are like played on the television there like all the time, you know, all these all, and, and like the pre the pre Bruce Lee stuff, especially, like the really like the Shaw Brothers, the early Shaw Brothers, all that stuff, is so so completely loved. Um, but then the third point is Uganda, <laughs> you know, and Isaac's brain, <laughs> and that's the blender. This movie was inspired by legendary Chinese film actor Bruce Lee. We decided to make this movie about uh, the Chinese Kung Fu and uh, the inspiration we got from him. Then into we just wanted to transform from Chinese Kung Fu to Ugandan Kung Fu. That is Bruce Lee. It's like because he's not imitating, but you definitely know what movies he loves. And that's what I saw in the Captain Alex trailer. Like we know he's watching Rambo, but he's not imitating. But we know, you know, his visual vocabulary. You know, we we know where we, we know the books he's read. We know that he's got the classics in it and loves it, but is doing something else. And but they are clearly Ugandan. But like to give you an idea, say to go to, to Bad Black. So like the the part with me is kind of like the Karate Kid, right? So yeah, the Karate Kid is you have a, a kung fu master teaching a child. Right, how to be the kung fu, you know, how to, how to do kung fu. In this case, it's a kid in the village teaching me, you know, which is great, right? But you know what's happening there? Um, that little child is Isaac. And he says that when he was back in 82, 83, you know, they were playing commando. And they were playing commando in like the killing fields. Like there'd be a, a pile of heads over here, there'd be a corpse rotting by the well, but you still need your water. Those fields, he's playing commando. They're just having, they're playing like anyone else. But his dream was to play with a real American. You know, kind of like in Terminator 2, you have your own Terminator, you know? And then when I showed up, that's it. That's what's happening in those scenes, is that little kid is Isaac as a kid. And so Isaac, when he was young, he you know, he was short but tough. That's what it is. There's a lot of depth to these. A, they're very personal films, which is not how you normally think action genre. The unforeseen and sudden fame amassed following a successful Kickstarter campaign brought with it certain risks inherent to the gaining of unexpected fortune, risks that Isaac and the crew would mitigate in typical bombastic Wakaliwood fashion. The next film that's coming is a child kung fu film. That film came about because of Captain Alex, you know, and we did a little Kickstarter that we asked for 160 bucks, we got 13 grand, you know. But I, I sat Isaac down before we did the Kickstarter to explain that, you know, the Kickstarter is public. So in theory, someone in the village could think you have $10,000 under your bed. Do you want people to know that? And Isaac being Isaac is, of course, yes, we need to. People need to see that we are loved and that we are supported and that we are here. But this is a, this is a real question. And we don't, we don't know where this is going or what could happen. And so, you know, Isaac got the actors together who have had children. And he said, OK, how about this? Um, what if we make an action film starring our own children where they're tough and they know Kung Fu and when people try to kidnap them in the movie, they could fight back. And so Isaac thinking that anyone who may try to kidnap the children in real life, probably not very bright, uh, but also would be fans of the movies. And when they see the movie about those kids that they could fight back, they may have second thoughts. Like how much more personal can you, you know, where it's literally the lives of your own children. Literally is that. And what do they do? They make a silly action film about it. That's wonderful. And so that's their response. And so that's, that's the next film. I want to ask about, I've got to ask, I've got to ask about VJME, man. Yeah. It, it, that's like oh, such a character. Well, he's, 
<laughs> he's, he's the first one to break out, uh, break out of us. So a VJ, uh, it's it's a video joker, and it's like a half narrator, half stand-up comic, maybe like mystery science theater. He's a cheerleader. You know, he makes you laugh. He's just, if the film is bad, he'll keep you entertained. Yes, yes, okay. This is VJ Emi, live in the studios from Wakari to Uganda. Get ready. Raymond Film Productions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Tighten your seat belts. And so what this this it's a very it's Ugandan. Yeah, it's very very specific to you get like that that's that, that whole kind of going to halls and kind of watching films in that kind of communal sense. That's that's very specifically Ugandan, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And it's also um, again, it's like a lower class thing, the upper class feel that you're you're destroying the movie. <laughs> yeah. Dinosaurs. Okay, yeah, so you could be right about that. But the flip side is it's really damn funny. This is Swaz. Swaz means Swazenegger in Uganda. And and so I think I'm the first one to ever translate it. And it's after over 30 years of a tradition. And and so from what I understand, because I'm the one researching all this, right? That's why I had to be there was kind of get all this, is that you have uh, the Idi Amin period, and then became the Civil War period. So for over a generation, the country was quite unstable. And then uh, it started to calm down. That was the first time in a generation, at least, where the country was opened up to the West. Like, what are people listening to? You know, what, what are people doing? What new dances are there? Isaac can do the robot dance, by the way. And he, does, and he can do it. He does it incredibly. They were like break dancing. All, so they were just open to anything outside. And of course, that's movies and so and that's like the reagan era america right so they were watching it but then the question was what is schwarzenegger saying maybe you don't need to know but what is schwarzenegger saying and that became a question so like what do you do because how do you technically subtitle like a vhs tape what dialect is going to be you know it, it's all it changes wherever you go and then the third was that you know literacy was a huge problem because the schools were all dismantled during that whole period. So literacy is a big problem. And then someone had the bright idea, like what if I just have a microphone and I and I stand by the stage and I explain to you what Schwarzenegger's saying. The only problem was he didn't know either. And, and it became like a lightning thing. It was like, it just exploded. And then Isaac had the bright idea. What if I dub my own movie into my own language? Even though now we don't need it, for exposition. What if we do it? And then it exploded further because now VJ was pure comedy. He doesn't have to explain it anymore. He doesn't have to take time out to say the dialogue. He's just making jokes and ripping up everything. So Captain Alex went freaking bananas. She was caught watching Nigerian movies. It's called a video hall there, the, the movie theaters, but it's like a, it's a very small room wooden walls, dirt floor, wooden benches they make, and two TVs. So one TV is playing the movie, the other TV is playing uh, a soccer game, you know, with the volume off. And and so if you don't like one, you watch the other. So it's a room like that, and one time it was pouring rain, so you had the, a metal roof, so you had the sound of the metal roof. There's no electricity, so it's a generator, and, and Captain Alex is playing, and Emmy is there, and there's like 200 people in this tiny room. There's no there's no room to lift up your hand. Like everyone is standing, jumping up and down in unison, going crazy. Like I was there in the front, like on the floor, like what the hell? They were going bonkers. What the hell are they saying? And so when I translated it, I was like, motherfucker. Like this is awesome. So, and then, it, then that was my whole thing that I sat down with Emmy and he wants to create like English slang now. That's where expect the unexpectable come, or super action. This was on the run. Movie. So that was a lot of it was I it was Emmy and I sitting together. And how do we capture that experience of like, you know, 200 people jumping up and these screaming over the VJ for everyone else? Hey. I'm baking German food. German food? Yeah, we found German tourists. We're cooking them. Oh, very, 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 very good. 
The Lysius served me the head like Predator. I did not want to release Captain Alex with no VJ and just subtitles. The reason is that becomes a foreign film. You know what I mean? It becomes categorized. And then the problem, the other barrier, if you're getting, if you're doing a drama, it's very acceptable to have a subtitled film. But an action movie, you don't, you don't want to read subtitles watching an action movie. So my answer was, let's have two subtitles. <laughs> let's, let's double down. But if we have the VJ, it becomes a unique film. It becomes a unique experience and you have to see it, even to say you don't like it, but you're forced to, to check it out. As hilarious an addition VJ Emmy is to anything in which he is included, Emmy often plays a crucial role in the structure of Isaac's films, which is in itself the result of Isaac's approach to story exposition, following the unique way in which Isaac was introduced to the medium as a child. There's definitely parts where you want the film, the film to tell the story itself. You want it to be quiet, or this, you know, when maybe we need exposition, like back to mafia or something like that. And this sounds crazy, okay? But Isaac, he did not see his first film until he was about 20. And what he knew about movies was from his older brothers who would sneak into these video halls. They would see the Chuck Norris films. Isaac never saw them. You know, my older brothers used to go to cinema halls. For me, I didn't go there. So when they came back, uh, they, used to tell, they used to tell me stories about the movies they have watched, like uh, I remember the, uh, the likes of uh, Buddy Spencer was one of the actors of that time, Wang Yu, Bruce Lee. So he grew up not with the movies, but with the stories of what the movies should be in his head. And then when he was about 20, he saved enough money making bricks to like buy a TV and a DVD player. And he's like, hell, I'm going to buy all these action films I've heard all about. And he'd watch them. He's like, this is crap. The action films are good, the action parts, but why is Chuck Norris making breakfast? I know he has breakfast. It's boring. And it's, it's, it insulted him. He's like, I know he had breakfast. What the hell? And so what happens, like if you notice in his movies, there's no shots of people going in a building or this is the hospital. You're just boom right to the content. You And, and what happens is what I, you know, when you pull the VJ out of it, it's like there's no, you can get a little lost because, because he's relying on the VJ to fill in those blanks. With the VJ, he'll say back to Mafia, and there we are, you know, Tiger Mafia base. What also happens, like when I would um, remove the VJ, when I stripped it down, like to clean it and things, um, what I realized is like some of the scenes, they're a little too long. And what I mean is like, you have, you have the content of the scene, but then the people just stand there for like two beats and then cut. And so when you remove the VJ, it just sits there. And I said, Isaac, you know, if we do this, we may have to trim it or something. And he's like, yeah, 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 I know all that. The reason I kept, I kept it long is because see that actor in the background, he made a funny face, he yawned. And I knew Emmy would do a joke with that. But, you know, he knows what he's doing. He knows that it's not necessary for the story, but he knows also Emmy and he'll make a good joke there. So in the beginning, I got a little worried, but he's like, no, that's why I do it. That's why I do it like that is because you're right, you know, trim it down if you don't have the Emmy, you need to trim it because there's no action there. It's just it's supposed to be a silly joke out there. Is this lunch? <laughs> this is not a joking subject, my dear. Um, so what's with the Ebola thing? <laughs> I know. Oh, the Ebola the thing. first time, right? The first time I saw Ebola Hunter, I fucking lost my shit, man. Well, right? What's the deal there? The Ebola Hunter. Okay, so <laughs> it's all true stories, man. So I'm in the village. Yeah, I'm living there. I think this is around 2015. And uh, there's an Ebola outbreak in Spain. At the time, it was happening in America, in, a, in like a hospital or two. And then uh, and there's other places in Africa. At the same time, our village was under quarantine. For, but not for Ebola, but for Marburg, which is a cousin of Ebola, but it's 90% fatality in Africa. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thousand times worse than Ebola. Now, quarantine means, uh, you know, why don't you just kind of stay at home? And, uh, you know, if you feel sick, don't go out. So, I, again, Isaac is an exploitation filmmaker. So he's reading the newspapers. He's seeing what's happening in Spain and America. He himself is kind of under quarantine. And he's like, Ebola's hot. We got to make an Ebola movie. And Isaac says this, and I swear to God, I swear to God. So he's like, he's talking about this. And I'm like, okay. And I go to sleep. The next morning, I open my door. And there's Ebola Hunter, the full standing right there. And I swear to God, I looked at him. I closed the door. I had a shot of whiskey. <laughs> 
Irish whiskey. <laughs> and then I went out. Okay, we need a Ebola hunter. And he's like, it's a Ebola hunter. We need to make an Ebola film. Because the world needs to know the, the dangers of Ebola. And who better to do it to explain and to save the world than Wakaliwood, who is under quarantine itself? You see, what it is is that, um, you know, if Isaac was, say, a professor at a university, who would have written some kind of thesis about the, the dangers of Ebola? But we're with Hollywood, so we blow heads up and make an action film. <laughs> That's what it is. And so the idea with the Ebola movie was that if that was going to be the, like, where we can like shoot it with fans around the world. Oh my God. Oh my God. What's happening to you? Oh, I think I have. I think I have. Oh, Ebola. Ebola. Ah. Oh my God. No. No. Uh, there's an Ebola outbreak in Sweden. We can have some friends dying like in a movie theater or whatever from it. And then it cuts to Uganda. Oh my God, our, the commandos in Sweden, they need our help. So the Ebola hunter like jumps into the helicopter. They go out and blah, 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 blah. Basically the whole world gets destroyed. Of course, you know, that's how it is. But it's like this international kind of action film epic. And we have to map this out and see what, what he wants to pursue. Because the plan was that, is like, let's let's do this global Ebola crazy movie. Either as a movie, or maybe it could be like a web series or something as we do this, the shows. But it's like, it's like let's let's all do it. All, everyone everyone in the world together, let's make this, let's make a movie. And it was going to be called uh, Super Ebola or uh, Ebola AIDS, you know, like, <laughs> like maybe Ebola AIDS is too I don't know, but uh, but something like that. Nose, maybe, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Like the trick was, uh, I think it's like if you cough three times, your head explodes. Oh, like, brilliant! And part of it is like the cars will bleed also because that's a, <laughs> a fun, funny thing. For one of the trailers, uh, for Tabatesula, like the car gets shot up and the cars themselves start bleeding. Like because Isaac thought it was funny, and they ask him, "The cars bleed in Africa? Like what's up?" With and he's like, "Oh, that's a good idea." But that, but that's the Ebola thing, and so the the beauty of the costume is that it's a full body costume. You know, we go to Ireland. You're Ebola hunter, dude. It's the Boba Fett of Africa. You know. What can you expect a lasting legacy of what Hollywood and, and of Isaac's filmmaking to be? You know, um, a lot of stuff is bittersweet. Uh, that's how I see it. And so when I was, you know, I'm sitting there in the village and, and I'm, I'm fighting on a technical level, you know, to get Captain Alex out. But Isaac was like, yeah, OK, that's a good idea. He wasn't really he wasn't wasn't really into it, say, you know, and I, I talked to him about that. And he said, well, you know, Alan, I know I think it's great. I think we need to do it. I don't mean it like that. What he said was, uh, you know, here in the village, you know, my dream was to make a work of art that was known that someone that would hit that would touch people far away. And when I saw that the trailer for Captain Alex had like a million views, you know, that, that was my dream. I achieved something that was impossible. My life was complete. And so, you know, it's nice, nice to have the movie out, but my life is complete. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not wait, enough. Yeah, no. wait for the movies, wait for Bad Black, all the cannibals, all this stuff. And he said his mission now more is the actors. You know, let let let's how let's give that feeling to the other people uh, that they feel that they've they've contributed something. And I thought that was just again very bittersweet, but I didn't get it. But then when Captain Alex itself, the film, the finished film, got out and became loved, that's that I start. I kind of feel that way. Like I feel like I have that feeling now. Like the guys did something impossible. Like I sounded like a crazy man for years saying, "Hey, there's a village in Africa. And they make movies. Yeah, without electricity. Yeah, yeah, yeah." And we shit in the bucket. We have no plumbing. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're good. And like, people thought I was completely crazy. But now they see it. And it's, I feel that way. The part that was impossible, that there's this, as Isaac calls it, it's the third world of the third world. You're in a village in a third world. You're in a ghetto of, of, the, of the ghetto of the world. To, to then become pop, you know, to see people online doing, you know, sequels to Captain Alex for fun or in video games using BJME lines like, you know, expect the unexpectable and all this. That was, that's impossible. And they did it. The, the future, that's just difficult. <laughs> that's just unlikely. And that's nothing. <laughs> like, that is easy. So what I thought is that um, it's going to take five films, maybe four films. And when people see four of his films, they're going to get it. They go, what I mean by that is it's not something like uh, 
just silly special effects. That these things have heart, and there's a lot more to them. And then you're going to start. You're going to, you're going to be confronted, I think, with this. With the reality is that there's an artist of international stature in this freaking village, and he was there the whole time. But I understand it. Like I understand it will take time because the idea is so nutty. So the tour is starting in in New York area. So there's that to Queens and the Schenectady, and then to Woodstock, and then we're going to Philadelphia, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and then it's spreading out uh, across the United States. And then uh, we're going to UK to, uh, for a little bit, and then to Paris and Berlin, I think, and then uh, Poland, I want, and Barcelona. And that's for the next four months, starting in May. Uh, and Isaac wants to direct the movie from Uganda, so he wants to direct action scenes via Skype and kill the audiences put in the new movie. Uh, so basically, if you come to the screening, you you can become a Ugandan action movie star without leaving you know, New York, say. And then we have the, then the DVD, Blu-ray, and uh, all the digital sales and sessions. Look in Asia, there, Korea, USA. Everyone is starving for action. In Uganda, our commando scientists are fighting to see how much action can fit on a Blu-ray. Yeah, we can add one more action scene. No, yeah. no, no, we can't. No, no, we can't no, do it. The we most possible. action we have is too much. Man, the Blu-ray cannot manage that action. We should put it in more colorful. We can do it. We did it. Yeah, Uganda's first Blu-ray, starring. It's basically that. It's like uh, we don't know what this is or where it's going. But what I think is that if people see that there's money in this, and I don't mean capital M, but if they see that you know you could put some time into this and get a return, I think what's gonna people are gonna discover is that there's many others. Like there's only one Wakali, say, but there's many others. There's many other films across the world, and I think they're gonna be start being discovered more and more in Africa, and South America. Well, yeah, I mean, if it can emerge from, as you say, you know, the, yeah. the most dirt poor of dirt poor places in a country yeah. that itself is dirt poor, you know, what other pools of talent are just sitting there waiting in slums around the world? I think so. You know, these cameras got into Isaac's hands, but he had no way to get them out, you know, so it stayed it stayed really local. There's other villages doing the same exact thing, and, they're, and we're discovering them. They're, we're connecting, like in Ghana, it's crazy stuff. Ghana happening, and then it's another village north of India and Siberia. They've been doing witch doctor films forever. There are these little pockets that have been isolated, but now with the internet, they're they're self organizing. And with the with the example that what Hollywood is is setting, as you say, yeah. it's it's yeah, only going to provide more of an inspiration for others to do it. There, yeah. I think, like you mentioned to me before, was. Um, especially for people in the West that have a lot more ready access to, to do things, there's no excuse anymore. You can no. you can get out there, you can make something, you can make it happen as long as you care enough to do so. Yes, and also but it, it, to, to couch that a bit, so much of it is luck, you know, and so much is timing, but you just have to do the work. I went into this thinking, and they did too. Like this, we're all on the same page. You just have to go into it feeling satisfied of that you failed, but you tried. Because so much, like like timing and luck, is such a big part of this. Like it, the timing was so bad when I went. You know what was happening in Parliament? That's I can't. That's timing, you know. But the fact that I saw it when I saw it, meaning, you know, I, I was I was serious about getting married. You know, I, I had. All my savings, I had no no credit debt, I had vacation time, I had air miles, and I was ready like mentally and emotionally to invest in, in a lifetime or something, you know? That that was just timing there. Then it, then it obviously it became Hollywood, you know, where my passion where I built my life with. Like part of my role is like there's this freight train coming out of control. And it's coming right, it's coming right to you, dude. Uh, and I'm in the front going, yeah, it's coming, it's getting out of the way, you know. It's like that. If I had seen the trailers when I was 20, I would have loved it, but I wouldn't have gone, you know, because when you're 20, you can think this is great, but when you're younger, everything is great. But as you get older, when you see something really special, 
you have the wisdom to know you have to do something. The way I feel anyway, like it, you know, if you see something really special and you have the maturity to know it's, it's, it's unique, you have to do something. Thank you for oh, no, joining no. us, man. A huge, huge, huge love and respect for you guys and for what you guys are doing over there. No, then, well, thank you, yes. Um, you're absolutely welcome here anytime to give us updates on what you guys are doing. And for myself personally, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of what I know is a, a very, very busy schedule for you right now to come and talk to us. That's no problem. I hope you enjoy-